Hello, I'm Glenn Richardson. I'm Senior Lecturer in History at St Mary's University College uh, in Strawberry Hill in West London. And I uh, teach here on early modern European and British history and have a particular specialism in the Tudors and Henry VIII in particular. Uh, La, you may know um, a book that came out last year, The Contending Kingdoms, England and France, 1420 to 1700. So that's the sort of thing that, that I do. Um, today I want to talk a little bit about Cardinal Wolsey and to address the question of why Wolsey rose and fell between uh, 1509 and 1529. And uh, although Wolsey is a very fascinating character in himself, uh, his career really only is important historically because of his close relationship with Henry VIII. And if we were being, um, you know, wanting to be very clever about it, we could say the reason why Wolsey rose and fell was because of Henry VIII. Um, and that was something that Wolsey himself uh, recognised uh, throughout his, his career. Uh, his career had begun prior to Henry's uh, reign. Um, he was uh, born in 1472 and educated in uh, Ipswich. Uh, where he uh, grew up and he went to Oxford and worked for a time after graduating uh, at Oxford as a fellow. He became chaplain to Henry VII and did a few minor errands to um, uh, the continent on behalf of Henry VII and he became in 1509 almoner to Henry VIII. The almoner was a royal official who was responsible for looking after the king's charity for ensuring that, for example, scraps of food that were left at the, uh, from the royal table were collected and distributed to, to the poor at the back door of the palace, that sort of thing. And also more formal donations which were made by the king at various times in the year. To some extent it was a sinecure, that is, uh, it was an office which you they were paid for, it got you close to the king and you could more or less do with it uh, whatever you wanted. And Wolsey did quite a lot with it. Uh, he was uh, called to the Royal Council within a few years of Henry VIII's accession and very quickly impressed uh, upon the king his own talents, uh, his eloquence, he was a very good speaker, uh, and not only the king but others that were around him. Uh, one of the principal sources we have uh, about Wolsey and why Wolsey rose and then fell uh, was a book which was written after uh, his death by his gentleman Usher, who was a bit like a, a personal servant, um, I suppose you could call him an aide-de-camp or something like that, um, who looked after him called George Cavendish, and he wrote a book called The Life uh, and Death of Cardinal Wolsey. And I'd like to read just a small section from that now, which tells you a little bit about why Wolsey uh, developed so quickly as he did. Um, and he talks about Wolsey as being a very eloquent speaker, people coming to him asking him to speak on their behalf to the king um, when he was at court with the king. And Cavendish goes on to say, in whom the king, that's Wolsey, in whom the king conceived such a loving fancy, especially that he was the most earnest and readiest of all the council to advance the king's only will and pleasure without any respect to the case. The king therefore perceived him to be a meet instrument for the accomplishment of his devised will and pleasure, called him more unto him, and esteemed him so highly that his estimation and favour put out all other ancient counsellors from their accustomed favour that they were in before, insomuch as the king committed all his will and pleasure unto his, that's Wolsey's, disposition and order, who so wrought so who wrought so to all his matters that all his endeavour was only to satisfy the king's mind, knowing right well that it was the very vain and right course to bring him to high promotion. Now, that's written of course in early sixteenth century English, but I think you can get the sense of it, that Wolsey quickly recognised that the best, quickest, fastest and surest way to his high promotion as Cavendish puts it, was to do what the king wanted. Don't forget that Henry was uh, a very young man when he first became king, only 17 years and 10 months, just about right age to be doing his A-levels when he became king, and he was surrounded by men who were much older than him, uh, in their 40s and 50s, who must have seemed very old to him, 
and Wolsey wasn't quite that old. I think he was almost 40 uh, when Henry became king. Um, but he had this way of communicating which, with the much younger man, um, which really interested Henry. And Wolsey understood uh, what to do. And not only Wolsey, but everybody else uh, saw what was happening. And very quickly, as Cavendish goes on to explain, uh, the only and the highest favour uh, was that that Wolsey attracted. So it's his potential, uh, it's his talent, it's his eloquence, it's his education, I suppose, that leads Wolsey to be in a position. And I guess he was lucky. I mean, he'd had a fairly indifferent career. He got himself into royal service uh, in his late 30s. Probably, you know, had Henry VII lived for another 10 years, Wolsey might have been a sort of fairly good church administrator, um, but not much else. There's no way of knowing. But he certainly, his personality seems to have impressed the young King Henry, and he, he Wolsey, knew how to exploit that. Uh, whenever he would want to introduce a, a topic of conversation, uh, he would so he would bring in. Uh, Henry liked executive toys, you know, uh, clock salts and uh, the kind of gadgets of the early 16th century, astrolabes and this kind of thing. And so Wolsey would bring one of them in and you know show, you know, look at this, your grace, how marvelous is this? You know? And while Henry was looking at that, he'd say, oh, and by the way, um, do you think we should uh, give so and so a promotion, or do we think we should, you know, prepare for war against France or whatever? So that's sort of the way uh, Henry uh, and uh, Wolsey worked, and it very quickly becomes a very strong relationship between the two of them. And it's really driven by the fact that Wolsey understands Henry so well. His desires for a peaceful, stable and well-governed kingdom, for a peaceful, stable and well-governed church. Long before the break with Rome, Henry is very interested in having control, not so much over theology or religion as such, but over the clergy, over the office holders in the church. He wants them to know that whatever their allegiances are to the Pope, etc., in England, he's the king, and uh, their first allegiance is to him. And that's quite apart from, from what happens later with the, with the annulment of his marriage uh, to Catherine. Um, and not only a stable government at home, but that Henry also wanted to make his name uh, on the European stage. And in another one of these uh, talks, uh, I've said more about all the details of the uh, foreign policy and who was directing foreign policy, Henry or Wolsey. So for present purposes, I'll just say that he was very interested in helping Henry to make a name for himself uh, in war against France in 1513, which Wolsey uh, helps to organise, and the aftermath of the war, the politics and diplomacy of that war, trying to ensure that Henry remained at the forefront of Europe throughout uh, his reign, is really where one of the major activities that, that Wolsey's engaged with. Uh, and by doing that, by more or less constantly giving Henry what he wants, Wolsey began to acquire, as rewards, offices and titles and uh, money, wealth, um, which made him quite exceptional uh, among the, certainly English uh, ecclesiastics of the time, and made him live a lifestyle that was rather more like a, a secular noble, or perhaps like a, he's, he's often called a Renaissance cardinal, and quite rightly, if you go to Hampton Court, you can see the uh, palace, the manor house and palace that he began to build um, on the proceeds of royal favour from the 15 teens and uh, although much of what you see now is what Henry did and later what happened in the 17th and 18th century the, the earliest parts of the palace are still very impressive and that's all uh, the result of Wolsey's awareness of the status of himself uh, as an international figure. But just to uh, remind you of, of what he gets when, after organising the first campaign um, for Henry against France in 1513, uh, he's rewarded with the Bishopric of Lincoln, and that's the first title that he has, and that's in 1514. The same year he becomes Archbishop of York. Uh, he also, for a time, is Bishop of Winchester, and also the Bishop of Tournai, or he doesn't quite get the job, but he has a claim on the Bishopric of Tournai. And in 1515, at Henry's uh, insistence, and Henry was very pleased about this, he was elected a cardinal. Um, his technical title was Cardinal St. Cecilia beyond Tiber, the church in Rome which, which the cardinals are, uh, which he was appointed to, because each cardinal has a church which they supposedly look after in Rome, and that was, that was Wolsey's. Uh, 
and in December of the same year, 1515, he became Lord Chancellor uh, of England. So he becomes, uh, within about 18 months, the leading legal official of the realm, uh, not the head of the judicial system as such, but um, uh, responsible for uh, the overall functioning of the judicial system uh, as Lord Chancellor and for the ratification of the King's ordinances and for parliamentary legislation, so he's in charge of all of that. He's also the senior churchman in England because although uh, as Archbishop of York uh, he is sort of equal or slightly less than, says the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, his, his, his the other great Archbishop, as Cardinal uh, he uh, outranks him. And then he goes one stage further in 1518 in the context of trying to organise uh, the, the Treaty of Universal Peace uh, on behalf of Pope Leo X, when he's made Cardinal Legate, which means that he is, has, uh, I suppose the, the technical word is plenipotentiary, has papal powers uh, within England. That led people in the 19th century and some parts of the early 20th century historians to speculate about whether Wolsey was more interested in the papacy than serving Henry, and whether everything Wolsey did was really about serving Wolsey and possibly the papacy, because at various times, not least um, towards the end of his career, um, he did uh, put his name forward uh, to become Pope. These days I think most historians would say that's probably not what's really driving him. I mean. He, he's certainly interested in anything that, is, uh, that does Thomas Wolsey any good, then, then he's interested. Um, he loved a, a lifestyle, he enjoyed uh, the finer things of life, uh, he was a great patron in his own right of, of uh, silversmiths, of sculptors, and all kinds of artisans. Uh, he had Italian, or uh, carpets rather, Turkey carpets from, from the, the, the near and Middle East, uh, imported through Venice. Um, so he certainly knew how to live uh, a, a lifestyle which was very ornate and uh, in keeping perhaps with uh, his contemporary cardinals in France uh, and in Italy. Um, so in that sense he's always looking out for himself. But whether or not he's that interested in the papacy as such, I think there's now some doubt about that. But what he definitely is interested in is helping Henry VIII and doing what Henry wants, because as I read from uh, Cavendish at the start, that's where he sees his whole, um, his whole focus, his whole reward, his whole drive, is on helping the king to get what he wants. And that suits both sides. So the War of 1513, uh, the peace treaty that follows in 1514, the Treaty of Universal Peace in 1518, the Field of Cloth of Gold in 1520, uh, Henry's next war against France in 1523, um, the peace treaty that follows that, the, the elaborate negotiations that go on between the middle of 1525 and the end of 1527 to repair the, uh, the alliance between England and France, um, to try and put Henry in a stronger position uh, against the Emperor with the whole business of the annulment of his marriage uh, in the background. All of that is Wolsey and he does, he organises all of that and you can't really imagine the success which Henry has um, on the battlefield such as it is but more importantly as a great, as a relatively great figure um, within Europe uh, at the time without uh, the advice, influence and, and work of Wolsey. Um, so that's sort of on the international stage.